So, what's everybody playing right now in terms of video games? Lego what? Worlds. What is it? Lego Worlds. Lego Worlds? Sword okay. Art Online. Sword Art Online? Which one? Uh, Lost Song. Lost Song. Okay. What was the other one? Um, and Dragon's uh, Quest. Yeah, Dragon Quest Heroes. Okay, yeah. And then I'm playing uh, Telltale Games. Um, uh, Minecraft Story yeah, Mode. Yeah, Minecraft, Minecraft Story. Minecraft Story Mode, Minecraft. And then uh, I'll soon be playing Walking Dead Season 3. And then I also got Final Fantasy 15 and Gears of War 4. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm playing Majora's Mask. Majora's Mask. Mm. All right. Kicking it up old school. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, what What are you guys like favorite game genres? Like, yeah. Wait. What? What genre? Well, like, a genre like genre. like an RPG mystery. Yeah. Sword, Sword Art Online. Sword Art Online. So kind of like an RPG. Yeah. Yeah. My, that's mine too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. RPG fans. Cool. Cool. I'm amongst I'm amongst friends here. <laughs> How about uh, everybody's favorite video game character? Just you can only pick one. Who would it be? Mm. Don't look at me. <laughs> pick something. Yeah. What's what's your favorite game character? <laughs> People have to think about it. I'll say Cloud from Final Fantasy VII. It's mainstream. It's trite. Whatever. Put it out there. Anybody else? Uh, I like the main character in uh, Sword Art Online: The Lost Song. Remember oh, him? Kirito. Kirito. Okay. Yeah, Kirito. Uh, what is it, Mumbo Jumbo, or from Venture Kazooie, the the skull guy? What's his? I forget. I've never played it. Oh wait, no, Ghost Rider. That's my favorite video game character. Ghost Rider. From Lego Marvels. Okay, Lego Marvels. Um, like there, I have so many like favorite characters, but like if I just had to pick like the smallest one, I'd probably say Clank. <laughs> for Back to Clank. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. What is it? What is it about about these characters or, the, or these games we've talked about that sort of draw you to them? Like, why why is that character your favorite character? What do you relate to in them or attach to? Mine has a flaming head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> With a well, skull. For for me, it's it's almost like uh, <clears throat> like any TV show or film where the the character the video game character has like. Depth to to it and, and uh, uh, dynamism. There, um, maybe there's times where they're funny or there's like they have some story to them. Okay. That's, that's, that makes sense in the context of the narrative of the you? video game. Mm -hmm. I think like like you know seeing you know going through the storylines and like some of the outtakes you know that they do you know actually like seeing from their perspective like what's going on and kind of connecting you know so that way you get more in depth into the story than just watching it okay unfold. cool we'll have a lot to talk about my name's john gale and uh i do i do a lot of things one of the things i do I'm, I'm part of the indie game dev group here in nashville and i've, I've got a game out here's the cards for it if you all want to like pick a card any card and somebody should have promo codes on the back of theirs. All right. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a block-breaking game to help people learn their Japanese alphabet. So that's that's the game I've got out there right now. I've been trying to learn hiragana or... Yeah, you know, get hiragana? Yeah, or hiragana, yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. You can do it with a block-breaker game. Yeah. Um, 2,600 characters. God, that's a lot. Well, that's, that's the kanji. Those, there's just 46. Oh, okay. 46 levels. And uh, I, I used to be an English teacher in Japan. Uh, I used to work for the Japanese government as a, as a cultural coordinator. So, so I have a master's degree in Japanese. So sort of researching culture and everything has been a big part of my career, uh, professionally and academically. So that's how I started this, this panel, is sort of looking into cultural research. Because I really love JRPGs, like Final Fantasy is my jam. You know, I've been there since, since day one. I played, I played the original too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Took me and my friends like six months worth of sleepovers to beat that game. And you had your Nintendo Power Guide and the yeah. and trying to it's go to it. Hours and hours and hours. Uh, the old of fashioned just, Nintendo? Of just grinding. Yeah. Huh? The old fashioned Nintendo game? Oh, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. yeah the like the Game Boy looking ones? No, the original, the original Final Gangster. Fantasy. Yeah. And been jamming out on, on 15 as well. Yeah. Loving it a lot. Uh, but I was, I was kind of really. Uh, heartbroken like over the past 10 years or so JRPGs were really on the decline for a while 
like commercially and critically. And a lot of people had a lot of reasons they were talking about out there. Um, and it was, it was just kind of, like I said, breaking my heart. Now I think we're in a real renaissance of Japanese games right now with 15 and my jam, Persona 5, just loving it. I, I haven't it's, read any of the Persona mangas, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, like, like this year in Fire Emblem, there's been a lot of noise in the JRPG scene, but before that it was really stale and they were really struggling. And I wanted to sort of do this research in, into why. And, and what I, I found myself realizing is that in anime and manga, and also Japanese video games that a lot of the characters are really young. And in sort of the Western games like Grand Theft Auto and Gears of War, they're like a lot older, they're adults. And what I found is that you, know, you have kids and adolescents in these combat situations with like these giant weapons, you know, defeating all these huge monsters and trained enemy soldiers. And I'm like, it's, I don't really believe it as much as I do with like Gears of War or something like that. Uh, Marcus, who's like a trained soldier and has a lot of combat experience. And so that's what I was thinking is like the believability of the characters. Is this even a thing? And what I found out is it is a thing. And it's something that's talked about and researched in the game industry a lot. And if you want the, the best book out there, I think, on video game storytelling, is literally called Video Game Storytelling <laughs> uh, by Evan Skolnick, who's a, a video game industry professional. And th this is a, a great read. And I, I list up all my books on my website, uh, johnsensei.com slash books. Like for the references I use in these panels. But he, he has an entire chapter on the idea of believability and how it's important to something called the Ludo narrative, which is a pretty big, scary academic term. So let's, let's kind of break into what we talk about, Ludo narrative. Um, so what do I have up on the screen here? Original Mario Brothers. Original <laughs> Mario Brothers, okay. So let's say you're playing as Mario. You may recognize this level. Uh, what, would you, what would you do next? I'd jump probably jump on the Koopas. You would jump on the Koopas, okay. Yeah, or jump over to the next uh, block stage, yeah, right there. Okay, right there, because yeah. then you can take that pipe uh -huh. to go up. Anybody else? Unless it's that pipe where it's got that secret brick, you know, over the top of that it. You to can get go to over the top yeah. of yeah. it to the warp zone, yeah. So each of us sort of made a different choice. This is, this is what Ludo narrative is, is it's you have a, a digital world, a digital setting, and it's actually the player themselves who is making the choices and creating that narrative. So your narrative is, I'm going to jump on the Koopa. You know, yours is, I'm going to go to the pipe. And someone else's is, I'm going to go to the warp zone. That's, that's the freedom we have to make those choices and create our own stories in a way, um, which is really different from any other media out there, literature, television, or film. So just as an example, I have up on the screen the original Jaws. I was trying to find something that wouldn't spoil anything. Hmm. So I think it's pretty obvious from the poster and everything that, that this woman swims out in the ocean and what happens to her? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's eaten by shark. Yeah. And how would we describe this scene? How would we talk about this? What happened in the movie? Suspense. Almost everybody gets eaten. Almost everybody gets eaten. She gets eaten. She died. The shark got her. Okay. And then the shark got electrocuted in some other And then other the shark movie. got electrocuted, right? And then died. And but then, then died. it came back in the other few movies. Yeah, the shark. What happens if we're playing Mario again and the Goomba hits Mario? What do we say now? He does. He? If yeah. I'm playing the game. Yeah, if the Goomba hits you, yeah, then you die. Yeah. Then you die? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I die. Uh oh. I died. What about if I'm playing Punch Out? What would I say here? I'm playing it. The on screen character gets knocked down. What would I say, probably? Man. I got knocked out. I yeah. got knocked down. Or outrun. You do these outrageous crashes. Yeah. I, I crashed, crashed my car. Yeah. Well, no, I didn't. You know, I'm sitting on my couch yeah. and my car's in the driveway. But this is the difference between. For example, watching a movie or reading a book and playing a video game. And this is what's different about games from everything else. And the, the academics and the scientists and the researchers have found this really fascinating, the psychology behind it, that they put gamers in front of screens and they count like, oh, look, they said, I died. And what they found is it shows, even with like those retro games, to what degree we take on the persona of the on-screen character in our heads. That essentially, yes, we are the ones falling in the pit and dying and so forth. And so that's what ludonarrative is different. That's what ludonarrative means. That's that type of narrative. 
Now, if you have problems with believability in the game, you get something called ludonarrative dissonance, which is another nerdy academic term. But to experience dissonance, we don't really have a lot of people here, but, and it's really early in the morning. Mm. But would you guys play along with me? Yeah. With this? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to count us off. I'm going to count to three, and I want everybody to sing something. Sing anything. Mm. Anything that comes to your head. Any song, any notes, whatever. You ready? Mm -hmm. Will you do this? No? Come, you can sing anything, I promise. Anything's okay. And it can be terrible. I'll, no. I'll be the worst. You can't be worse than me. <laughs> he doesn't like singing. <laughs> I hate singing. I hate singing? I just listen to it. You just listen? <laughs> you, anybody else want to try this? He will, he will hum the theme song to Minecraft for hours. Okay, you hum the <laughs> Minecraft theme song. Here we go. <laughs> One, two, three. Oh, this one's a triumph. E -E I'm making a go your success. E -E what do you boom think? Boom. We sound great, right? Sound no? Sound pretty terrible, right? Yeah. That that feeling that of of all the wrong notes and everything mixing together, and you're shaking your head like, oh no, that's dissonance in music. That feeling right there, that's called dissonance. And essentially, you can have the exact same thing in a video game experience. You could be playing the game, and if there's something with the believability, then that could give you that same feeling of dissonance. And one example the author points out and other people have on YouTube and <coughs> such is from the, the Tomb Raider reboot a few years ago. Has anybody played that? Yeah. Played the original. Yeah. Is it? There's, a, there's a moment in this game uh, where Laura Croft first kills somebody, kills one of the bad guys with a gun. And she gets like really emotional about it. It's like it's like coughing and crying and about to puke and everything. And then when the player resumes control of Laura, she goes on to kill hundreds of people, hundreds of bad guys throughout the game, and doesn't really bat an eye about it. So this is a moment where you're like kind of something things Confused. feel kind of out of sync, you know, in terms of the story and the gameplay experience. But it, overall, it's a very good game, so you forget about it later. But that's one example of like how ludo narrative dissonance can come up in the video game experience. So what I did uh, last year is I, I put together a, a survey and a study and uh, surveyed over 100 people where they, they looked at these eight video game characters and sort of rated and discussed how believable they thought they were. And there's some from JRPGs and some from uh, shooters and whatnot. So here's what they would see. They would see a picture and a description, and then they, they would choose one of these choices. They didn't see the numbers, they just saw the choice of how believable they thought it was, and then they picked one, and I assigned a score to it, and put all these numbers in an Excel sheet, and then eventually ranked the characters in terms of believability. So for example, Franklin from Grand Theft Auto V, he was considered the most believable, and uh, our JP, JRPG characters are down towards the bottom there, some of them. Hey guys, morning. Morning. And uh, we, can, we can see our younger child characters are down at the very bottom in terms of how gamers thought they were believable. Um, so here are the reasons people thought that those characters were believable. And let's just take these apart one at a time. If you're playing a game, how much do you think the game setting affects the believability of the experience for you? Not so much for me. Not so I much for it. you? Okay, so if it's like science fiction or real life or fantasy, I'd rather have oh, the genre life. doesn't matter. It, it, it's like the if if the game is following the laws that it's set. Okay, like, yeah. Are you yeah. Mean like what? like a little cow? Like for example, we have here our fantasy JRPGs are kind of lower versus like our real life crime drama or our real life zombie, real life historical fiction of Assassin's Creed. I know with uh, I love the Grand Theft Auto series, but I cannot stand. GTA 4, because I okay. hate the city. You hate the city? The city, the city itself city. is just mm. terrible. But like, versus Grand Theft Auto 5, the sort of crime, real yeah. life drama yeah, that doesn't respect them. Yeah, it was more open. Okay. Like, the fact that it was such a closed city just completely ruined the game for me. I, I love the game itself. Uh -huh. The storyline is fantastic, but I just, I can't replay it like I do every other one. Yeah, like okay. the first, Sa like the first or the second Saints, like the first Saints Row was great the second one was you know it was okay but the third one when they started like delving into like tron territory i was like all right you jokers lost me okay <laughs> yeah okay. okay yeah we can talk about that later yeah. later. how about uh the appearance of the characters 
You've got some that are more like an anime style, mm -hmm. some that are more photorealistic. Mm -hmm. Well, something that really like, just because like, I'm so mechanically inclined and like, s like you know, logic based, like if I see like an eight year old kid we wielding something that looks like a hundred, like a hundred pound sledgehammer, uh -huh. I'm just like, yeah, no, the physics on that don't actually work because that kid would never be able to get that thing an inch off the ground. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Although I, I think they're like whenever like I, I watch a movie or play a game, there's always like some sort of suspended disbelief. You yeah, have to yeah. suspend, and so it's like get to that in a minute. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like you know, I mean, it has to be a fine balance, mm -hmm. but like yeah. okay. you know, I mean, because if I'm seeing like like a six foot tall Goliath kind of a humanoid creature wielding a hundred pound sledgehammer mm -hmm. that I can see okay. you know, that I can like yeah. kind of get behind and we'll, we'll get to the reason why behind all that there's a key word behind that and we're, we've almost hit on it how about the age of the characters you talked about a little bit like the, the eight year old with the, the giant hammer or whatever not so believable anybody else anything about age that affects your gameplay experience yeah kind of Kind of. I mean, if you're, playing, if you're playing a shooter and, you know... And it's an old man. If you're playing a shooter, but, like, the an adult male or adult female is, you know, for, like, weapon purposes, is using, like, an, like an M16 or an, or an AR, or, you know, or an, or an AK-47, I can understand that. Yeah. But if you're trying to say, oh, well, this 10-year-old is using an M4 or a, you know, a Mo or a Mosin, I'm just like... Yeah. I don't know if that's believable. A twenty-two long rifle or a twenty-two pistol, I can understand. Or something like Splatoon. Yeah. Yeah. Age, I, I, yeah. I think, has um, there's like archetypes to age. So, um, like an older character would be maybe a wiser, you know, traditionally like a wiser, like a wizard. Um, younger characters uh, may be a little more agile, and like maybe middle-aged characters may have more strength um, and power. Um, so if there was a, a young character who had like a lot of strength, they would seem out of place, according like to to tradition. Okay. Um, but if that small character was like a was like a support character who was really good at stealth or getting into small spaces, that then makes sense. That, okay. Yeah, then it makes like logistical sense. We're, we're almost hitting that keyword I'm looking for about what really maintains the believability. And we're going to start to get there. How about the description of the character? When I put together this study, I didn't write these descriptions. I took them all from fan wikis and official websites. But what I found is that each character had essentially a background and a role or a task that they perform in the game. Even an NPC would have these things. And this is also from, from the book, Video Game Storytelling. The narrative depiction of the character, background, what that character does in gameplay, the role task. And what we found is there's the key word right there, consistent, consistency between these two things is what maintains the believability. And we've hit on it a couple times here, you know, things have to be consistent within that world. As long as the laws of that world are okay with it and it's consistent, then we're okay with the believability. It doesn't break that experience for us. So I originally thought we've got these two huge blocks, background and role task, and we've got to keep them consistent. The consistency is what maintains the believability. If you need it. Okay, thank you. But the background and role task can be further broken down into the five W's, one H. Have you learned these in school yet? What? Who, what, when, where, why, and how? Definitely. Oh, Definitely. First grade. First grade. Okay, yeah. We've and learned these in like the first grade. And what it really is, is that all six of these have to be consistent with each other. This is sort of like a litmus test we can apply to our video game story or our design to make sure that everything is consistent and believable. And I've, I've tried this out with myself with a, with a game I designed. Um, we had a game jam here in Nashville. And when you go to a game jam, all they do is give you a theme. And the theme is grow. And they're like, take this idea of grow and make a game with it. Whatever, whatever your idea is, that's fine. So my idea was, let's say you have some goal in the sky and you've got to grow a, a plant or a tree or something to get the player up there. That was my idea that I went with. I threw this together in RPG Maker um, within like 30 minutes and I was like, okay, now I have to start asking those questions. 
Why is the why is the player trying to get back up there? Uh, well, because that's where they live. They're like a fairy, and they've got to get back up there. Well, if they're a fairy, why don't they fly? Because uh, they fell and they injured their wings. Why did they fall? Because there was an evil goddess who pushed them down. That's that's her temple up there. Okay. Well, who is she? What's her deal? Why would she Why would she push the fairy off onto the island? They're enemies. And like the whole game really just built itself out by asking those those questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Where we're on an island, so she can't get anywhere else. She's got to grow that plant to get back up there. And that's what I was trying to do, is just keep everything consistent, fill in the blanks as much. And you can play this game on my Itch.io site. Are you guys familiar with Itch.io? Itch.io. It's a, like where indie game designers can host games and okay. things like that. So that, that's up there if you want to play it. Just something I threw together in RPG Maker in about 15 hours or so. Um, but, but still trying to follow that 5W1H consistency. So let, let's talk about uh, one of the characters in my study, Carol from Tales of Vesperia. Anybody familiar with Heard this game, it. with this character? I love the Tales of series, but I had a lot of problems with Carol uh, for some of the things we talked about. Who is he? He's just an ordinary 12-year-old human boy. And the party stumbles across him in the woods uh, one day, and he's got this giant hammer, and he's like, I'm a monster hunter. You know, that's what I do for a living. I've got this huge hammer. And there's no mention of him going to school or his parents or any brothers or sisters. Uh, no, no superhuman strength, no magic powers or anything. But he carries this gigantic hammer, uh, which he uses to defeat, you know, the huge vicious monsters and trained enemy soldiers. And so, for me, this is just me, there's a lot of Carol fans that come to my panels sometimes and get really upset, but I would argue that this is inconsistent right here. The character's background, how he physically appears, and what we see him do within the gameplay, and that this is what affected my experience with the Tales of Vesperia game. And it may not even be the age or anything like that. If we compare Carol to another 12-year-old boy from a magical <laughs> world, Harry Potter, uh, we could run this this same type of test. So who is Harry? He's a boy a that wizard. has magical powers. He has magical one. powers. He's a boy. He's a wizard. That, that lives in a giant castle. He lives in a giant castle. Wears and glasses. Reads wears books, glasses. You see him do what? Friends. Make friends. Go to class. Learn Defeat. magic spells. Defeat some enemies. Yeah, sometimes. and then. He uses those magic spells we've seen him learn yeah. to defeat enemies. Mm -hmm. So Harry Potter, if we took him as a video game character, is, is much more consistent. Mm -hmm. Even though it's quite extraordinary and, and maybe unrealistic, but still yeah. consistent and believable for that narrative experience. So really with, with Carol, um, it wouldn't take a lot to make him a more believable character. If we added 10 years to his age, He's now 22 instead of 12. Okay, I got no problem with him out living on his own yes. as a monster hunter. Reduce the size of the hammer a little bit, you know, and now we've got a, a completely believable character. Better monster because their parents didn't know that's why he does that. Yeah, yeah, some some sort of background like that. So, how important is believability <laughs> to the that is adorable. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> And this is not the only real-life Sonic the Hedgehog video so out there, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> when you get back to your rooms or whatever, get on YouTube and enjoy. You're welcome. They should have touched him up with some paint and made him look like actual Sonic with making him wear shoes. Yeah, I'll give you a hint. He rolls up in a corner and goes to sleep at one point. So <laughs> That's funny. Can the real hedgehog do anything we know that Sonic the Hedgehog He can't do? jump. He can't, can't jump. run fast. He can't run fast. He can't collect rings. No. Nope. But when you play the Sonic the Hedgehog game... Not entirely sure if it likes chili dogs. Yeah, I already yeah. played that one, Generations. Uh-huh. One of my favorites, yeah. Uh, do you accept this is a blue hedgehog that can run faster than the speed of sound? Yep, except yeah. for Flash. Except for... Okay. They're both the... They're both, they're both the same speed. But you, you accept this. You don't have a problem, even though it's completely detached from what a real hedgehog is right. like. And if you can accept Sonic's background, you can accept what Sonic does in gameplay, run fast, jump, barrel through walls, and all that type of thing. So this is about that suspension of disbelief you mentioned before. This is why video games do not have to be realistic at all. Um, because when we enter into this narrative experience, uh, we agree to suspend our disbelief. We agree to believe 
this. And it's up to that author or creator or game designer, uh, that's their responsibility to maintain the suspension of disbelief. So even if we look at characters with giant hammers, going back to Carol and his giant hammer, even giant hammers aren't the problem. There are game characters with giant hammers, like Amy from Sonic the Hedgehog. If you can accept Sonic for who he is, you can probably accept Amy for who she is, right? It can still be consistent within that, that world. Um, and does anybody recognize this game? Dark Cloud for the, the PlayStation 2, what a classic JRPG. Um, there's this character, Goro, who has a giant hammer. But when Goro's first introduced in the game, he jumps down from like the very top of a tree, has this conversation with the main character, then like in a single bound jumps back up into the tree. And then later it's introduced, he's the son of the strongest hunter that ever was. And so there's narrative reasons there for him being able to have the physical strength to carry that hammer. And we see that visually as soon as he enters the game. So again, uh, consistent of how, why this character can carry a giant hammer. And that wasn't there with Carol from Tales of Vesperia. And some of this is talked about in a, a YouTube video I just watched this week, uh, discussing Bayonetta, how you know over the top and campy it is, but it's still the story is still complemented by the gameplay, and it's maintained that consistency. So as crazy as Bayonetta is, it's still a believable game experience. So when I was thinking about media and fiction being realistic or not, I had this very distinct memory from this very specific issue of Iron Man that I read a few years ago. And in this, in this issue of Iron Man, Tony Stark goes to a really high-end, fancy party, and he leaves the party with this, you know, really hot convertible and this really hot girl. Is this consistent with what we know Tony Stark to do yeah. from Iron Man stories? Yeah, this is what he does. It also turns out that girl was the villainess of the story. She was the bad guy. Is that consistent with what Tony does? No. Yeah. yeah. Now, while they're driving, this girl covers up his eyes so he can't see to drive. But they still have a conversation for a while. And after a while, she's like, well, why haven't we wrecked yet? And Tony likes to explain his brilliance. At this point in the comic, the Iron Man suit is something that just oozes out of his skin, thanks to something called extremists. I don't know if we have any other Iron Man fans in here, but that's what it is. He just thinks, and the helmet comes out, or the gloves come out, or whatever. So that would be convenient. But uh, what he's doing is he, while he's driving, he oozed the gloves out of his skin, and the gloves have these eye nodes on them that feed visual data directly to his brain so he can see to drive through his hands, even though the bad girl's got his eyes covered. Cool. What do you guys think? Cool? Yeah? It would be so distracting. So distracting? all of your life, you're used to the visual impulses coming from right here. Uh -huh. So to have them from a different source, anyway. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. that's what happened in the comic book. We think it's cool. What if it happened in like the Iron Man movies? That'd be weird. That'd be weird. Yeah. That would be weird, right? He never okay. does it. Why would that be weird? I think it's because different media have what I call different degrees of separation from reality. That a live action movie or something is much closer to the reality we know. We can get further away with it with animation, comics, and then video games, I think, are a pretty extreme distance from reality. They can get away with a lot. So if those Iron Man I knows were like an upgrade in an Iron Man video game that improved your targeting or something, would you believe it? Yeah, it'd be yeah. more believable. We'll believe it in a comic book, too, because when have comic books ever not been far-fetched? That, you know, that, that's been the history of the medium. But like you said, when we get to the Avengers movie, it starts to get weird, right? And I think because the live action is a little too much closer to reality than the video game or the comic book, so we're not going to accept it as much. Uh, a couple years ago, this news came uh, out that, that 20th Century Fox was developing a live action Mega Man movie. What do you, what do you guys think? That, that'd be hard to pull yeah. off. That would be hard to pull off, yeah. Again, uh, almost sounds gimmicky. Yeah, I mean, gimmicky. because, like, just. Um, like what was it back in the like back in the eighties? It was a uh, Captain N and the Game Master. The cartoon, Car cartoon? Yeah, yeah. And they were trying to do the Mega Man world, and like even then, from the original Mega Man, it like the level didn't look like what was actually in the game because right. they, they had like this big stomp boot, uh, you know, robot, and I was just like, wait, that's not in the original Mega Man as far as I can remember. Because 
Mega Man works great as a video game. Yeah. Because he's so far detached from it. And he could even work in comic books, but then like some of the cartoons, it might be harder to pull off what's in the game. Yeah. So they had to make something up for not, the cartoon. I mean, not to mention, if you're doing like a live action Mega Man. Yeah. I mean, just the boss worlds, that, that would be so much CGI. Yeah. Because there's no way they could actually pull that off live action. Right. Period. And actually, someone's already tried to pull it off. I'm prepared to see the one at the top. The one ben at the top? Vin Diesel is Mega Man. Vin Diesel is Mega Man? I cannot. I just cannot. Huh. Maybe it's some real, that's just a, a joke. It's I not a real movie. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the first exactly. one movie? Uh, but that's a real movie. There was a real indie live action Mega Man movie that was made out there. I think if it's like an indie fan, fan made film, most people are willing to give it the benefit of a doubt or whatever. But it's still got two out of ten stars on the Internet Movie Database. Wow. So <laughs> I haven't seen it, but apparently it's, it really is that bad. Um, so again, probably because when you get the live action, we're too close to reality for something like Mega Man to work out. But completely believable in a video game. Yeah, okay, Galaga. Everybody recognizes it? Another Definitely. point about a video game being believable is it doesn't require a lot of narrative, a lot of dialogue or story. We can take something classic like Galaga where, you know, this is all you see. This is all you get when you, you play the game. You have to defeat every single spaceship. Yeah. That's pretty hard because they all shoot at you at once. But you know to do that without being instructed when you just pull the game out. Is up. there a storyline for that game? All I know is when I started up, do do Maybe now, back in the day, no. Yeah, it's just like you yeah. can just... You have the baddies, you attack. That's yeah. what you do. But let's, let's apply the, the litmus test, the five W's, one H to, to Galaga. That's a different game. Who are we? A spaceship. A spaceship. Yeah. Nobody in it, just a spaceship. That's just I, I thought we were attendees at Hypericon. But when we look at this, we're taking on the identity of that spaceship and we say, we're the spaceship, or I'm the spaceship. Oh, interesting. What are we doing? Killing a lot of monsters while they're in their spaceships trying to kill you. Okay. Why, why would we do that? Why are we shooting at those bugs? That's the point if of the we game. we don't kill them, they will kill us. Okay. To, to proceed. I mean, to it, proceed? It isn't there, it's like face, the bugs are facing you, you're uh -huh. facing the bugs. You're facing the bugs? Okay. Uh, up, it's a uh, war. Like going, it would be different if um, the spaceship was on the top of the screen and uh -huh. the other things were at the bottom. Uh -huh. Because at the top, that's like the direction, like up, yeah. it seems to be that's like, like it's trying to progress. break through their line yeah. of defense. Uh -huh. I never considered that. There's all these like. That it's going from bottom to yeah. top. I don't think there's an end. There's yeah. visual cues. Like, because there's not narrative, you have to rely on visual cues. All right. Like, so, like, those big, those, <laughs> those ones at the top, which are the most dangerous, are the biggest ones, and they're, right. they have the most. I'm not sure that I'd be okay with being Don't forget about the alien ship one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, the same, it's like the same like thing. You try to go backwards. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's like the same thing with the original Contra. You know, you were moving up. Mm. Yeah. That but when it got to, you know, Super Contra, it, you know, it's, you know, side-scrolling. Mm -hmm. so the like, side-scrolling levels, they're always left to right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. they're not right to left. Because yeah. if it goes right to left, you're just like, wait, I'm going backwards. What right. am I doing? Unless it's something like Mario 2, where you kind of, yeah. Uh, the big ones, ones. Well, yeah. the reason why they're strong yeah. they're yeah. there's also precedent like um, space invaders the same mm -hmm. year going up they established that where are we in, we play in outer space. space in outer space how do you know that because it has stars in the background and it's totally black yeah totally black background with the little the little colored and white specks that's all we needed no, all I'm we totally needed except the fact that, that it's outer space stars are multicolored uh huh. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That I is, see that. Of course, that's exactly what it is. When They're are blue, we? Right? The future. The future. Maybe. maybe. Mm -hmm. It's not so important. You don't have to have all the five W's, one H there. It seems like the future because it has uh, spaceships that can shoot guns. Right. Yeah. And like bugs that have uh, tractor beams on them, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. How uh, how are we playing this game? What's our control scheme? Literally a button and a button. joystick that goes side <laughs> to side. That's yeah. it. So you, you move the joystick left, what happens? You go left. A ship goes left. If you hit the button, what happens? You fire. It fires. Let's say it was like the reverse. Let's say you hit the button and the ship goes left. Let's say you push left on the joystick and the ship fires. So then how do you go right? 
Well, press I the guess. button again. Press the button really fast. We just fast. keep going left until you get circled. That that would be really frustrating, right? Yeah. That would really break the narrative gaming experience. In fairness, for you. you do have like directional pads where it's technically two buttons that you're using. Heard of it. And it would you heard of it. And like and like because of how simple Galaga well, is, like if there was a if there was a button you know, to either accelerate or break the ship going forward or backwards, then it would be, it, like, it would break the game because there's, like, wait, I can't go that far forward Yeah. because I might get hit. I might go up there. It'd be pretty cool if it was 3D. So, you know this game, The Order 1886? I've seen it. I've seen it? somebody play it on YouTube. You've seen somebody play it on YouTube? Anybody that was else? when I was in second grade, the last time I ever saw it. I mean, I've, I've heard of it. I've just never played it. Nobody's ever seen it. It's the original Xbox, so... <laughs> okay. Yeah. What I put forward with this game is that you can actually have, unlike Galaga, you can actually have a lot of narrative and a lot of dialogue and a lot of story and possibly still an unbelievable experience. So, when you look at this game, what type of... When you just look at that, that trailer screenshot, what type of game do you think we have here? Like, a fight, a war game. Like war game? Okay. Vic Victorian England. Yeah. With uh, you know, futuristic weapons at the time. Okay, what type of genre? Is this going to be a puzzle game? A future and old kind of game because if they have those kind of guns in eighteen eight eighty six, uh -huh. I can't believe that. It could it could be like a like a historical drama mixed with a little bit of a first person shooter. Okay, maybe a first person shooter. Okay. What, what we have is a, a third-person shooter, like Gears of War, um, set in an alternate Victorian London, alternate steampunk universe where they've got all these, these cool advanced weapons and everything. Old-fashioned uh, wagons. You play as a, as a secret order uh, to, to Queen Victoria that hunts werewolves. So everything's okay so far, right? Pretty consistent. We would believe this. Um, this... Uh, this game, not a lot of people are excited about, but the author of this book, Extra Lives, which also has a chapter on believability, Tom Bissell, he really loves this game. He, he says, who are we? We're an elite core of werewolf hunters. But then we start to ask, what do we do and how the game's designed? But what do they do? They actually do not hunt very many werewolves in the game. Uh, how do you play the game? A lot of cut scenes, a lot of quick time events, like you see on the screen, press X button really, really, really fast. You've got to press the X button really, really fast to close the door on the werewolf. I'm thinking of Tomb Raider. Little like action. The, the reboot of Tomb Raider. I talked about that earlier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, very little action, very little shooting in our third person shooting game. So, I can what see that. I'd say here is there's an inconsistency with how the game was made. You give people these cool steampunk weapons and they're werewolf hunters. And someone even told me in a panel, I've not played the game so I can't verify, but somebody told me actually in the game you do not shoot a single werewolf. And so how the game was made and designed and presented is inconsistent with the who, what, when, and where of the narrative. And that, that clearly affected its reception. It was uh, reviewed very poorly. It sold very poorly. This was a, a big PS4 exclusive that Sony was pushing and it did terrible. Uh, that developer all they did was Sony work. They did God of War remakes and, and Resistance games and things like that. They were a Sony exclusive developer and Sony cut them off after the failure of this game. So now the livelihood of all those developers and artists and everything is at stake because of the one inconsistency with the how. So that's yeah, yeah, I mean, affected, with, yeah. With how that game was set up, I mean, it just, it just as easily should have just been a Telltale Games Mm -hmm. game because that's what it sounds like. Yeah. So, that's it for this panel on video games. I do have another one at 12 in about an hour from video, uh, Zero to Video Game Designer where I, I talk about how with no programming experience or anything I designed and released here Ghana Breaker. Uh, so that's going to be in panel one, the other room at 12 today. And then tomorrow I've got my career panel at 12 and panel three or I talk about how I'm one of those kids who's like, I like anime, I like Japanese video games, but then I actually got a master's degree in Japanese and made a career as a translator and a teacher out of that. So that's in my career panel tomorrow at 12. I want to thank everybody for coming in and listening and participating and having such a great discussion this early in the morning.
I hope you all enjoy the rest of the con. We do have about 10 minutes or so if anybody wanted to throw anything else out there for discussion or um, ask questions or anything about the game experience. Well, like, uh, uh, like with Elder Scrolls, uh -huh. like, yeah, the graphics have gotten better, but like the overall concept of the game has never really changed. Uh -huh. You know, there's there was like a point where I was getting into a discussion about different games uh, with uh, someone that works at GameStop, and you know we we got to like talking about Elder Scrolls and be like, why do you have to walk everywhere, or your only other option is a horse? You know, why can't they like fast travel? Yeah, well, yeah, well, well, I mean, no, like, why can't they like put it like upgrade the timeline to where like it's a little bit further into the future so that way they actually have technology mm -hmm. like at some like at some different kind of a speed it's like why can't you have a compound bow why can't you you know you know have swords that are made out of different you know out of in, uh, better metals to where they don't break nearly as much and you know why does everything have to be like wood huts and stone castles you know why can't you know be it's like medieval. well yeah but you know but, but it's still yeah yeah but you know it's like it's that's that's an important point with a lot of games. So graphics and everything got better, but not a lot of development and progress in, in design and yeah. storytelling. In guide. Minecraft with Skyrim, it's still medieval. It's still yeah. the same. Yeah, it's like, why can't they have micro-quests? You know, instead of like, you know, I mean, there's like the main quest line, and then there's like the magic quest line, the fighter quest line. It's like, yeah. why can't you just be like, oh, well, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to save this farm from this, like, band of 15 wolves that keep attacking cows. So, you know, so that way I can get some wolf pelts that I can trade in to go do something else. But I think, you, I think that's part of the problem with the JRPGs, too. Like, they kept turning up the graphics and the, making the videos longer and everything, but their core gameplays and core... It was the same story every day. You know, something happens to the teenage protagonist, and the world's about to end, and that teenager is special, and only they can save it from this greater evil that we didn't know about till later on. They just rehashed that story over and over while turning up the graphics and everything. Uh, but now with Persona 5 and everything, we're seeing them starting to push that. Yeah. Also with the game consoles. Uh, this is why I have so much respect for Nintendo, even though I don't own a Nintendo system right now. Even with what happened with the Wii U, Nintendo's always willing to take the risk to push the envelope, uh, even if they're going to stand to lose, uh, whereas Sony and Microsoft, you know, it's just the same thing but better. You know, a few more features. Better graphics, Netflix, that type of thing. Sony has some of the same games as the Wii U, so. Yeah. Minecraft, well, Sony, Minecraft. Sony's also been in dire straits. I mean, that's one reason, just in their film divisions, that Spider Man is back with Marvel, is because once that hacking incident broke, oh, you yeah, know, yeah. The, ju just before that unfortunate incident, Sony had really streamlined everything that they were doing and really can pick what they were going to be doing. That's why the Amazing Spider-Man series, for example, isn't around anymore because after that, they're like, we just, you know, our, we placed our bets and we lost big because of this. Yeah. Oh. Um, and, and the video game uh, console, like PS3, was a glorified Blu-ray player mm -hmm. for yeah. the longest time. And it's just like, you guys really need to, you know, get off your ducks and do something different because mm -hmm. this whole... And picking, you know, kind of keenly, yes, you, yes, you, yes, you, yeah. isn't going to work for you for very long. Whereas Nintendo, they lost a lot of money on the Wii U, but they still have zero debt as a company, and they still have billions of dollars of cash reserves. So yeah. Well, I mean, it's the same thing with Microsoft. I mean, they don't, oh, yeah. they don't turn anything down. The only reason why, you know, there isn't like as many games from the Sony side. Is because there's that war between Microsoft and Sony. They're like, oh well, we, you know, we can only have you know this, and you can only have that. It's like just cross over games and just be done with it. Because the games that Sony doesn't have that Microsoft does, that's what makes their brand, yeah. and vice versa. It's Here's like, a war in Halo. Yeah, it's yeah, it's like Halo and then God of War. And uh, you know, and Ratchet and Clank, and uh, you know, and uh, Gears of War. You know, it's just like, just yeah, just like just switch them over and be done with it. And there's another thing to to consider about it as well, and that is story. I mean, what really made these franchises into franchises was the story. All right. Yeah. Gears of War and uh, Halo, and then what you see. Like, for instance, when Halo 4 came out, it was noticeable how short the storyline mode was in favor of multiplayer. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, you know, 
yeah, multiplayer is cool, but at the end of the day, the whole reason you made it to a Halo 4 is because you care about Chief and Cortana. Right. And it was like, so if you're going to ditch story, you're going to ditch your gaming, and you might as well just not put out games and just do online land characters or, yeah. you know, design your own characters and go online. This is why I talked about Destiny in my internet toxicity panel oh, last night, because that's exactly what happened to me. I love the Halo characters and story and just assumed Destiny would have that similar depth of, of narrative, and that it just it didn't. It was online, you know, player versus player, which is fine, but yeah, it's just not my thing. See, I've never played a Halo game. I think uh -huh. it was just random... Man, I read the Halo novels. Uh, I read the Halo comics. There is Halo I just story. I assumed it was yeah. just a standard first-person shooter where I'm just killing a bunch of aliens or whatever. Well, and, you're and then you can save humanity. All right, well, we're um, almost going to be extinct. Well, in the well, except well, for the, the one that well, is my own prejudice for that style of game. Yeah. I'm so used to like Quake or whatever. Yeah. Like, what? What's the story? There is no story. You just go in and just shoot people. Well, 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 well in the in the first Halo. The whole plot line story is a little, you know, wonkier, like a little bit lost. But like once it gets into the second game, then it, like it's all Halo about story. See, one of the see, greatest masterpieces. Like, see, that's just the game. Like, I just, you bring up a very good point. If you beat it on Legendary and you go through the entire tough game, like they have like little co comedic sequences where Johnson actually dies, you know, hugging <laughs> an elite and he says something funny. I don't think these guys plan on their beating sequence. You know, they're like, yeah. we'll just put in these little funny Easter eggs, and then once it blew up, Microsoft's like, so what else you got? Yeah. And they're like, oh, okay, and then they make Halo 2, yeah. you know, and they kind of iron things out, but I don't think they counted on it being that great. But I mean, you know, you do have some other firsts, like jumping was significantly, significantly improved in the first Halo. Uh -huh. I mean, before then, it was like... Yeah, like a yeah. one-block jump. <laughs> yeah, it was like the Master Chief is like, what, six foot seven or something? And like he's jumping that height, yeah. you know, and you can actually make over things. And and, so, and sometimes the game will cut you slack and you're like, I'm not going to make it. And then he just gets, more and gets up there. there. And it's just like that unpredictability creates you know, real life feeling and bam. That's or, why or, they added know, jump boosts yeah, on the back. Or, you know, or using a grenade jump. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like a lot of first, per what attracted me to Halo so much is like the other first person shooters I'd played, like Star Wars ones or Turok the Dinosaur Hunter, there was a lot of platforming, okay, yeah. and I was like, well I can't see the character's feet, so I'm always falling and getting killed. There's a lot of puzzle solving, there were like boss yeah. fights that, you know, were, were really hard for me at the time with the technology, and I was like, Halo is like straight up war. It's yeah. like it's like you gotta fight a war and get that point A. You don't jump oh, platforms. Yeah, you don't yeah. solve a puzzle or fight a boss. The, it's really just about saving the so city. Unpredictable, but yeah. sometimes you actually make it. Sometimes you're not actually seen, and you're like, please don't let them see me. And you're able to sneak around instead of having to go face to face battle if you don't have any bullets. Yeah. You know, and and you, and and the. You have to sometimes think like a tactician. Like, yes, yeah. like, and sometimes you just have to say, screw it, I'm going to chance this. Yeah, and in Halo 3, when they added the skulls, that is when it really got interesting because there, there's, like, hidden skulls, like, in every level, and, like, every skull allows you to do something a little bit different, like unlimited ammo, or you can jump higher, or you can go invisible, or you can, you know, or, you know, or you can have big heads. Some, yeah, them, some of them are comical, but, as yeah, as yeah, but, like, some... There, yeah, but some of them are really hard to find, or some of them are really hard to get to. Yeah. Like, there's one in, uh, I think, like, the second level, where you have to, like, go over a fence, run along a pipe, and then jump over a, a ravine to get to the small little cliff to get the skull. And half the time when you get the skull, you can't jump back. You just have to die, and, and, you know, but you, get the, but you already had the skull, so it's fine. Yeah. I really love those, uh, the, the reboot of Tomb Raider. Yeah. But it, it can bother me just like to no end, specifically her like climbing stuff. Because, like, okay, just you're climbing up this wall with your pickaxe or whatever. On a straight right. rock wall. And it's just, <laughs> all right. No ropes, nothing, just, okay, I'm just going to jump from here to way over there. Yeah. No. Yeah. This is not worth it. Like, you know what, I'm going to pack up, I'll just go home, because this is not worth it. Yeah, because not even Olympian free rock climbers yeah. can do that kind of crap. Yeah, I'm just, I, I, 
my thing I talked about in the panel, I think I think you missed it, was that yeah. when she first kills somebody, she's like puking and freaking out. And, like, and I tried to count it. I was like, I think I've killed about 400 people throughout this game. Oh, <laughs> you know, and she never bats an eye. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, it's yeah. it's oh. like, were there even, how could 400 people even fit on this island? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, like, if, like, as a, as a mechanic in that game, if, like, how, like, in some magic games, there's magic points. If they would have put a, like a me, like like a mental point bar, yeah. so like every time oh, she awesome. so every time she killed someone, it you know it would go yeah. down, and so she would have to actually rest and recuperate her ment you know mental acuity. They should have grapple uh, counts. Yeah, like yeah, 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 an internal darkness counter, and so like you could only go through it so far before you just had to like take a step back and chill. They should just add grapple guns already. Yeah, which we'll see. That's one which I really wish to go to backstory. I want to know the backstory for those characters on Don't Star. Any of y'all play like Don't Star? Dark Star? Yeah. Don't Star. Don't. Don't. Don't Star. Don't Star. Don't star. Don't star. I thought you were saying like Dark Star. My bad. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Don't Star is it's a like wilderness survival or whatever. And it's absolutely ridiculous. And crazy hard. It's yeah, it's all like cartoony, it. and yeah, it, it's one of those where it's you like get so upset that you die. But no, no, that's not. I, I'm, I'm starting again. It's like a more dangerous animal yeah. crossing. And it, so do you think it's inconsistent? The that there's there's no actually there's no uh, story though. Look at Minecraft. <laughs> Look at Minecraft. There's no story. There's no like. There's no direction on like where to go or what. It's to just do. mine and craft. Because you have that bad guy that um, Maxwell. Yeah, that makes, has the machine or whatever. Minecraft's just life. A 